What's up, kid? <laughs> I've got you covered, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, I got to tell you something. Uh, before I got to come over here and work on uh, Arrow, uh, I worked with Matt Nabel on a really amazing uh, biker series, a little bit like Sons of Anarchy, but it was the Australian version. It was uh, called Biker Wars. And uh, Matt's performance was staggering. I, I had a small part. I played this biker called Sunshine. I was his muscle. He brought me into his gang as muscle. But this guy's performance as this leader of this bike gang in Australia was like, it left Sons of Anarchy for dead. Thank you, mate. You're too kind, buddy. We never got to work on Arrow together, but I just love this guy's work. Oh, thank you, mate. And Maybe likewise, I'd, uh, um, when Manu stepped on set to that thing, which was 2011, um, I wasn't quite He was wearing a pair of football shirts and a singlet. And uh, I remember thinking, who is this? Like, is this... Is this some guy who's come from a bike gang and he's coming down to watch? And, and when I realised it was Manu, it was, uh, it was wonderful. And we had a great time together on that. It was only a, a short-lived sort of thing for both of us, but it was, um, it was wonderful. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't got to work on uh, Arrow yet. So we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, mate, we'll see what happens there. All right, so uh, here's what we're going to do. First of all, since we sort of brought him out separately, how about a big round of applause for these two guys, Matt Nabel, Manu Bennett. Two of the main reasons why Arrow is, is such a huge hit. So obviously, as you guys know, this is all about you and your questions. We've got a line, uh, where's the line cooking? Uh, just, yep, we're gonna get you guys, uh, Pillar 34, I was, uh, I was can, told can I, to say. Can I just say something yep. about, uh, I, I don't know whether they're here. Are my, are my friends from Mikasuki here? Are my Mikasuki friends here? M are maybe we here? scared them off with the intro. St stand up if you are here. Oh, okay, I don't know where they are, but, but anyway, there's some, there's some ladies walking around the convention center today, the part of the Mikasuki tribe, and they were Indian, they were an Indian tribe that came further from inland, and when the Howitzer gun came and started slaughtering the Indians in huge numbers, their tribe ran, and they ran down into the Everglades down here, and they lived there for like, uh, I don't know, the past 200 years, and it wasn't until Miami got built up that they even discovered that this tribe was out there in the Everglades, you know, protecting themselves in the swampland. And these guys are survivors and, and very, very special local people for you people. You know, they're, they're real tangata whenua, we call them in Maori, which is the people of the land. Anyway, they gifted me with this, which is their colors. So wherever you are, my friends, thank you. Hey. All right, let's get some questions. Uh, how's it going, Matt? My name is Brandon. Um, Hi, buddy. Ray Shal Ghul is a super genius in the show, and I just wanted to know if how you felt, did you picture yourself going out with the same moves by Oliver that you took him out with on the mountain? Um, look, you know, the, the, what they tried to do, I guess, for the character for Raz Al Ghul was um, in this interpretation which which I got to play was just to uh, as far as a fighter was to give him like an economy of movement so everything was really really precise yeah uh, and in that first uh, battle that we had up on the mountain that's how it was choreographed so the stunt guy a guy called Tim Connolly who's amazing came up with that idea of you know Raz having his hand yeah. behind his back the whole choosing time choosing no weapons choosing no weapons and um, you know, like they, they did, they were very, very aware of what the character was as well. So, you know, I just sort of played the text that they gave me and also then the moves they gave me. And, um, and it worked really, really well, you know, like Stephen, uh, the arrow at the start, uh, particularly in that fight, was, you know, wild. He's got his swords and, and the whole, I guess, the whole story of, of Raz, um, that's one of the first times you saw him in the, in the series, was just to make him very calm. Um, yeah. and, and uh, in control. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Brandon. Good on you, mate. Hi, this is for Manu. I'm a huge fan. Um, I really loved your stuff in The Hobbit. Your performance I thought was excellent. What is it like to um, work on something really, really huge like that, and then also, you know, work on Arrow, which, you know, the set and production, I'm sure, must be much smaller? Yeah, you know, every, every production has its, uh, 
its own signature when you go to work on it. You know, uh, going to work with Peter Jackson on The Hobbit, they're spending $200, $300 million on a film. You know, and you feel, the, you feel that, that expense when you're there and you see the technology that you're working with. I mean, when I arrived, uh, when I was cast as Arzog, I was actually in the last couple of weeks of filming Spartacus. And I wouldn't have been allowed to do that. My producers would never have let me go, but my agent and I decided to just catch a flight down and do it. And my producer freaked out when they knew that I'd gone down and done it. But I went, well, what did you expect me to do? I, I, there's no way in the world I would have missed that opportunity. Uh, Peter, you know, Peter Jackson is, is such an unassuming character. You know, you walk, he, he walk, when he's arriving at, at, at Park Road Studios where we were filming and the, and the weather block, uh, it's, like a, it's like a general is arriving. Everyone's like, Peter Jackson is five minutes away. Peter Jackson is four minutes and 30 seconds away. <laughs> Peter Jackson is 10 seconds, eight seconds counting. And then this guy walks in and he hasn't got any shoes on. He looks like a hobbit. <laughs> and he's like, hey guys, how you doing? Yep, 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 okay. Manu, nice to see you, mate. Love you on, love you on Spartacus, well done. Good stuff, okay, here we go. Okay, we ever got everything? And I'm standing there in this, in this little tight bodysuit with balls all over it. Because I did Arzog. Arzog was done in, in, in motion capture. And so I felt like some kinky guy at a German key swap party, you know? And I didn't feel like a man at all, you know? It was kind of like, like when Andy Serkis did Gollum. I mean, wearing that suit, I get how he could do Gollum, you know, because you look a little skinny thing. But when you're coming out and you're trying to play a big character, I felt really diminutive and it was hard to get my head around it. But working with Peter, Peter was just so unreal in terms of sort of opening up the visual of the, the world that I had to be in. And, uh, and it, was just, it was just awesome. Um, you know, of course, you know, when I ended up in the cinema at the, at the premieres, like I went to the premiere in London. And they, they, I mean, it, they, I don't think there could have been a bigger premiere in London than, than this final installment of The Hobbit. And that was just mind blowing. I mean, mind blowing. I'm just a kid from Newcastle. Me and Matt are two rugby playing boys from Australia, right? We're just real two country boys, really at heart, from, you know? And, uh, you know, just ending up in a place like that in your lifetime is, is, is quite daunting, you know? And amazing and wonderful at the same time. Uh, you know, the funny thing about Arrow was that I was just coming back from a trip over to Kuwait with, with the Spartacus crew. We went over and saw the American troops. And when, uh, when I arrived in LA, I had a three-day stopover, and my manager rang me on the last day, four hours before I was meant to be at the airport, and she said, can you go to an audition before you get to the airport? And I said, I've got to be there in four hours. And she said, it's called Arrow. And I knew Stephen Amell because Stephen, whether anybody knows this or not, was one of the three actors that was flown to New Zealand to screen test for the role of Spartacus when Andy Whitfield became ill. So I'd, I'd met Stephen in that process. And then I'd seen his billboards around LA and it just sort of seemed so, I don't know, it seemed so coincidental that this audition rocked up. And, uh, and when I got it, I had no idea about the DC comic world. I was, I, was I was arriving in the immigration department in Vancouver when my manager sent me They've released the, who you're playing in the, in, in, in the series. And when I'd done the audition, it was some guy called Hathaway or something, Halloway. And when I, got to, when I actually got flown into Canada, I'm, I'm in the convention, I'm in the immigration line, and I'm going, they're saying I'm playing some guy called Slade Wilson. I, who's that? that? That's not who I auditioned for. And the guy behind the immigration counter went, are you playing Deathstroke, man? He's like badass. And I'm like, so really, I found out who I was playing in Arrow by the immigration guy at Vancouver <laughs> Airport. And then I got to the studio and they told me. I wish I hadn't signed my contract at that stage. I would have known I had a ballsier position to, to <laughs> negotiate from. But, but to be honest, you know, but, and, and you know, like Arrow is, is such a vehicle for entering the American market. Spartacus was a, was a sleeping dog that people picked up, you know, from the underground. Arrow was like pop, popular culture immediately. So for me as an actor, it was a huge springboard opportunity. And, uh, you know, I'm super fortunate to be, to be on it. And then the wheels keep on turning and Matt comes in. As I said, Matt, Matt was my boss in the, in, the last, in the last series that I did out of Australia, you know, and he was incredible. And when I saw that he was cast as Ra's al Ghul, I was like, wow, isn't life a small circle, eh? Hey, brother. Exactly, yeah. It all comes around. 
right, well, how you doing, guys? I just want to thank you both for bringing two of my favorite characters to the screen and doing a great job with it. And that rolls into my question as, as you partly answered it, did you know how big and grand and the lore, and when did you realize how big and grand those two parts would be for the fans and, and all that? Um, look, you know, to be honest, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't know uh, what I was getting myself into. I, I had the, the, the producers came to me and offered it through my agents. So it wasn't an audition process that I had to go through, which was really unusual for someone like me. I usually audition for everything. So whatever the producers had seen me do before, um, they were fairly certain, I think, what they wanted for the character. Uh, and in saying that, I, I didn't know who Raz or Raish was. I, I, I had no idea. And they said, look, you, the, they want you to play Raz al Ghul. Um, and I was, I said, I, I don't, that doesn't mean anything to me. And then my manager said, do you know the Liam Neeson character in Batman? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, a great role. You know, and I wasn't familiar with the DC comic world or the mythology of, of the League of Assassins. Uh, and so subsequent to that, Liam Neeson had somehow come out and said um, <laughs> that he'd like to reprise his role of Raz al Ghul and Arrow. Now, I, I can't speak intelligently as to whether Liam was being serious or not, but the fans don't know, so they, you know, they hang on to that and they think we're getting Liam Neeson and then it's, re you know, released that they're getting me. And they're like, who the hell is this guy? Like, we were getting Liam Neeson, now we've got Matt Nabel. So, uh, coupled with the fact that it was a, a very big role um, within the DC comic world, which I then read extensively about and, and watched the other portrayals and interpretations, with the fact that Liam had come out and said that, so now that you had me, I felt um, from going from, from a position of not knowing to a position of immense trepidation and fear, that you know and pressure hoping that i didn't bugger it up i didn't want to do what someone else had done before and i certainly wanted to please the fans because it became acutely aware to me very very early on after signing on that how important he was in this show and how important he was in this realm so for many the first you know a couple of weeks on set were a little bit nerve-wracking for me because i didn't know how people were going to respond uh to the character so thankfully um so far, uh, it, it's been a pretty warm response. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much. And how about you? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, to play, it's interesting because in Spartacus, I got the origin story with Spartacus. And in Arrow, I got the origin story with, with Oliver. And I think there's, you know, they're, they're classic roles when you've got that relationship structure because you end up going through a brotherhood story and there's a mixture of love and hate that really helps build the drama, you know? Like, uh, he and I were very close on the island, you know, and it was just a set of circumstances that were almost sort of Shakespearean in their right. tragedy because it was kind of like a mistruth. Like, you know, like I, I basically assumed something and he assumed something. It was like Iago was like talking in my ear, you know, and it was, it was like the, the madness came from the script and yet the audience knew that it was a, a mix of, uh, of, of you know, rights and wrongs on both sides. So, uh, you know, I've always just tried to keep the, in terms of, you know, honoring Deathstroke and Slade Wilson. It, to be honest, when I, when I first got the role, I went to a convention in Ottawa, in Canada, and I ran into, uh, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the comic book, uh, the, the artist's name who did the, uh, the Teen Titans cover? Anybody, anybody? You're gonna win a free signature <laughs> if you can answer this. Who? Ah, oh, Perez, exactly. George Perez. Who said that? Because, come on, oh, okay. Come on over afterwards. <laughs> but, oh, you said it first. Oh, they said it first. Oh, yeah, you come over as well. There's two of you can have it. Yeah. Here, Manu. You're just giving away a lot of money, my friend. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just come borrow some from the assassins. Oh, please. <laughs> anyway, so, you, you know, uh, George Perez took a look at me at Ottawa and I said I got the role of Slade Wilson. And George Perez looked at me and he said, you don't look old enough. You don't 
really? He gave, and I, I was gutted. I was gutted. George Perez basically shot me down. <laughs> he was a bit, you know, I think, I think really he thought, you know, because Slade was probably Caucasian, I'm Maori, so I brought a bit of brown to the character, right? But, you know, the, the Slade Wilson in the comic books is a little bit older, you know, like maybe in his, you know, late 40s, early 50s. You know, I'm 45. When I told him I was 45, he went, oh, oh, okay, okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, but basically the, the, they put all that silver through my hair and created all of that stuff that went along with the, with the comic book, and so they created the look a bit more. But, you know, I was, I was really gutted about what he'd said. But about five or six months later, after it had all gone to air, I was at another convention, and I ran into um, Marv Wolfman. Now, see, Marv Wolfman wrote Deathstroke, Slade Wilson. He gave that character the character. George Perez just painted him. But, you know, so when I, when I ran into Marv, I didn't know who he was. He came up to the side of my booth and he went, Manu. And I went, yeah. And I just thought he was a, a fan from the crowd. And he went, great job, great job. And I went, oh, thanks, mate. And he walked <laughs> off and somebody said, do you know who that was? And I said, no, and he goes, that was Marv Wolfman who wrote Slade Wilson. <laughs> and I fucking, ju I jumped out of my seat and over the table and I ran up to him and I went, Marv, Marv, dude, I didn't know it was, I, I, dude, thank you. You're my father. <laughs> your, your son has returned. And, and you know, he took me in his, he took me in his hands and he said, I love what you're doing with the character. Everything that I wrote about Slade that makes him vulnerable and strong and all these different shades that make him a gray villain, not really a black villain. He said, you're hitting those notes. And, uh, and again, I take it back to what I was saying in the origin about the brotherhood story. Because when you've got that brotherhood story and you go through the good and the bad, that's what gives it all these shades of black and white, which makes it gray. You know, and that was, that's the whole thing about Slade Wilson. The whole Mirakuru love triangle thing, that's an invention of the television series. It's not linked into Slade Wilson defending his son that was killed by the Teen Titans, which is a different kind of mission. So in, in order to try to stay away from the craziness of Mirakuru and not make Slade into just this guy who's answering Shadow over his shoulder, like, what did you say? Oh, okay, kid, I'm gonna kill, what did you say? Yeah. You know, I, I, I had to stay sort of trying to make him morally astute in the middle, so that when he said, I keep my promises, whether he's crazy on Mirakuru or whether he's right there in his Lamborghini winding down the window saying, I'll see you soon, kid. <laughs> he's being honest, you know what I mean? Awesome. And that was important. And I just want to say one more thing. I hope DC realizes how good you guys are and brings you to the big screen one day, too. Oh, that'd Thank be great. You. Cheers, brother. <laughs> good on you, mate. Hi, uh, I'm a big fan of you guys, and because of you, there's been a new opening for villains everywhere. Uh, my question Thanks, is a, a, my question is a two-parter. Uh, first for Matt, which is, do you hope for a race sequel in the next season? Oh yeah, you're, you're always hopeful. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, at, look, the way things ended, uh, they didn't end well for for Raish. Um, he got his come up. It's in the end. But look, you know, within the the DC comic world uh, realm, you know, they've always and and CW have always found a way to bring characters back. So um, yeah, look, I, I had such got to be honest, such a wonderful time playing the character and having. Uh, to be honest, it's the most fun I've had as an actor playing any character. Um, which I didn't expect, um, and when I say that, I don't mean that in a bad way. I just my expectations were were pretty uh, blank. I, I had no idea what to expect, but I walked away from it um, immensely satisfied and and had a wonderful time. So I'm very hopeful, mate, that I that I get to come back and and uh, and be a part of that world again. So fingers crossed, mate. And the second part is for both of you. If Raish does come back, are you guys hoping for a team up? 100%. Yeah, look, uh, from a personal point of view, um, obviously. Oh, yeah. I'll invite him to the bar and we'll have a couple of shots of Mirakuru. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> See how that turns out. Let's go. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd love that to happen, you know. Uh, professionally to, to work with Manu again would be great, um, but also to have two. Uh, 
you know, like I said, they are villains, but I think both of those characters have a moral code uh, and they don't see themselves as villains, which I think is the most interesting part about both of them. I mean, Raish is, you know, construed as a, as a pretty evil sort of a dude, but when you consider, you know, one of the pieces of text I got was he's replacing evil with death. Um, you know, he's got a moral compass that he follows. So I think that'd be the most interesting part of, of doing that. Thank you. Pleasure, mate. I have a question for both of you. Do either of you guys hope to fight the Flash? Oh. It'd be a bit quick for me. <laughs> I just want to pull up next to him in my Lamborghini. <laughs> Everybody knows that Slade got the Lamborghini, eh? You know, I, I went to production and I asked production because they told me I was going to come to Starling City and be really wealthy so that I could influence Mo Moira Queen. And I said, well, how did I accumulate all that wealth? And they said, oh, I don't know. You just, you, you know, you swam from the island. You started doing network marketing. Next thing. <laughs> Bit of Amway. <laughs> hey, you know that soap you guys are using up there on <laughs> yeah, that mountain? That's it, yeah. That was for my network marketing. That was from you, Sam. No, <laughs> no, but I said, if he's really wealthy, can I have a Lamborghini? A black one. And the, uh, and the producers went, no, you know, no, we, no we, we, can't, we don't have that in the budget. So I went to Lamborghini in Vancouver, and I met the CEO by chance from Italy was there. And I said, we drove up to Whistler and back in these like 20 Lamborghinis. And I came back and I said, listen, you know, can, can we... Uh, I was Why aren't I doing this? I was in the Four Seasons. I know, mate. It was classic. Jesus. And I, I said to the CEO, I said, listen, you know, I'm doing this show and I'm playing this really, you know kind of big character from the DC world. He's not really a, a, a total villain, but he's kind of on the dark side. But I'd love to have a black Lamborghini Aventador. And this Italian guy was like, sure thing, we'll make it happen. So next thing, I went back to the production, and they're like, what? And in comes this black Lamborghini on that night, that, that night shoot outside the mansion. And everyone was just in awe, eh? And when I was sitting in that car, just revving it, and I, and, I, and I wound down the window, and Oliver came up, and I said, I'll see you around, kid. And then I went, boom. The film crew was in front of me, and I took off, and they were about as far away as where you, got, you guys are with the camera. <laughs> and I floored it, and I went, boom. But they had the braking system. Like, I, I, I took off, and I stopped about an inch from the camera. <laughs> and the guy behind the camera was like, Ugh. But anyway, I'd like to get that bad boy and pull up next to the Flash one day and say, hey, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Hi. Um, so, Mr. Armanu, after seeing uh, Deathstroke in season three on Lian Yu, do you think we can expect to see him again in either Arrow or Flash? Listen, it's, it's, it's a very, very uh, simple thing. They need to want to write it. I have to be available to shoot it. And the two roads have to cross at the right time. I'm under another contract to a show called Shinara. We just finished filming our first series. That's going to come on MTV later this year. I'm playing a druid called Alanon, and it's a really good role. I've enjoyed it. Fantastic. Another, another really strong character to play. But they've allowed, in my contract, the ability to do several episodes on another show, namely Arrow, if it becomes available and we can work together on it. You know? Um, it's a, it really is possible, but it needs to just tick a few boxes, both in their corner and in my corner. You know, but for the sake of the show and the fans, you know, I know the fans want more of Deathstroke. You know? Yeah. I mean, he hasn't even, he hasn't even come to the Suicide Squad yet, you know, which is, which is huge in the comic book world for Deathstroke to enter that realm. So, you know, mate, I'd say the best thing is for the fans to keep on asking it and, you know, for Mark Guggenheim and all the other producers and, and me to be able to meet at a table and say, okay, this is doable, let's do it, you know? And that's, that's, that's just the, the short of it, the short and simple of it, mate. Yeah. 
All right, guys, I, I hate to be the person to do this, but uh, we are out of time, so we have Aww. to wrap it up. I know. <laughs> I know. I, not my fault. I don't make the rules. <laughs> How about a big round of applause for these two guys, though? Manu Bennett, Matt Nabel. And remember, you can watch Arrow weeknights at 8 right here on SFL TV. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll see you in the next couple of days. Thank you.